beginning there was Jack, and Jack had a groove, and from this groove came the grooves of all grooves. And while one day viciously throwing down on his box, Jack boldly declared, let there be house, and house music was born. I never thought that my songs were going to start anything. It was just stuff I was just writing at home that I wanted to listen to. From the underground clubs of Chicago, house has grown into the biggest musical phenomenon since rock and roll. If somebody told me when I was younger that this music that we were making in our basement would be the shot heard around the world, I would say, give me some of what you smoking, pal, because it's just unbelievable. Fifteen years later, house dominates pop music. From Madonna to U2, no one has escaped its restless beat. I think the house is a feeling, and I think that if you don't feel it, it can't be house. It's a feeling that's turned DJs into superstars. It's not just about playing the latest bunch of tunes. Never has been. And it's made nightclubs into global brands. I certainly know that when a DJ gets out there and performs fantastically and does a brilliant job and there's a wicked crowd, you really can't beat it. You know the score. It's not just a type of music. It's a way of life. It's just a feeling in the clubs that you get from these driving tracks, these great tracks, great songs. And I just see all of these people enjoying this music that they don't really understand why it was even created. You know what I'm saying? They don't even understand the basis of what House is trying to do from the get. It ain't about pop and eat. It isn't. This is the story of the people who made House. The soundtrack to our lives. Anything that starts off underground is House to me. I don't care how big it gets. If it started out underground, and, and it had that, that big club feel, and that's house. We stole everybody's music. I mean, that's how we created our sound. The way the Chicago guys did it, they just took, like, disco grooves and rehooked them up, you know what I mean? beginning it was the gay and black people that really kept dance music alive disco dance music uh, it was really danceable R&B music that we were dancing to and it wasn't until Saturday Night Fever came along that it exploded and every goomba and the you know the suburbs start dancing if I can't have you. At the end of 1977, Travolta showed everyone how to do the hustle. Disco came out of the underground. As the whole world caught Saturday Night Fever, Mel Cherin's partner, Michael Brody, had a vision of a new kind of nightclub. Michael and I said, if people can dance together, they can live together. And that's why it was so important to bring all kinds of people, black, white, straight, and gay, together with music. And one day, Michael called me and said, Mel, I found the guy that's going to make it happen for me. And he was talking about Larry LeVan. This is 84 King Street, Paradise Garage. Larry was the talent. Larry was the music. Larry was the imagination. Larry was the spunk. Not to just, you know, polish up Larry, but the truth of it is the truth. Larry was everything. Opened in January 1978, the Paradise Garage had the biggest dance floor and the best sound system in New York. But it was resident DJ Larry Levan 
who made the garage legendary. Sometimes you get a thing for me and you want my company. Yes, you do, baby. So he played music sometimes that was so intense, music that made you get down, made your body go down. He'd say, see that crowd over there? Watch what happens when I put this record on. It was like Snake Charmer. He made you go like this, he made you go like that. He wasn't great at mixing. It was He could if he wanted to. That wasn't his thing. He knew how to play a song. He wouldn't just play one sound or one style. Drop in disco, uh, various different rhythms. That whole night you went in, you just came back singing songs. And you went home just thinking about what happened last night. Such an exciting time and place. New York was the heart, and that's what attracted me to New York. I had to go because I was so into the music. You gotta push it to me, baby. Push it to me, baby. You gotta start it to me, honey. If you want my money. If you want my money. You gotta make it good as honey. He's technically a genius. The actual bass speakers were named after Larry. They were called the Van Horn. You know, he controlled everybody. That was his job. He would shut the music and go down, get a ladder, and clean the mirror ball if he didn't think it was clean enough. And out of nowhere, boom, blast the music. Everybody, oh! Come on, you can get it, get it, get it. Anytime, tonight is fine. I got my mind here. Come on, you can get it, get it, get it. Anytime, tonight is fine. First time I went, I was 17 years old, and I was like, oh my God, you ever seen a place like this before? When you first went into it, it was like entering Dante's Inferno. They spiked the punch, okay? And they would tell you that they were gonna spike it that particular night. So that meant the, the whole crowd was was just all on ass. You know, and next thing you know, you're just like so spacey, and then somebody's handing you a popper, and you're doing the popper, you know, and 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 and, and everybody hired playing. All the deepest corners of the club, all right? You, you have people engaging in sex, you know? I could never figure out how people could stay up that long, because I was, I was kind of quite young then, and I wasn't aware that they were doing drugs. So me and my friend, we used to just stop all night and, you know, come seven, eight in the morning, we were literally exhausted, but then we brought out the coffee and we were on the coffee, and I always used to fall asleep on the subway going home and end up stuck in the Bronx. A taste maker of resolute individuality, Larry was an inspiration to a generation of DJs. Larry could create a house party atmosphere with 2,000 people. It really got me into the to the whole club and, and DJ kind of thing. Paradise Garage set trends. Paradise Garage was one of the first of its kind. And 20 years later, people are still talking about the influence Paradise Garage had on music in the culture. Disco sucks! Disco sucks! But only 18 months after Saturday Night Fever, dance music was facing a massive backlash in America. Disco sucks! Disco sucks! Disco sucks! Yeah! And Steve Dahl was blowing up disco records out of Comiskey Park and, you know, getting all these rock and roll heads to join in. And, uh, you know, there was a huge backlash on, on disco music. This is now officially the world's largest anti-disco rally! In 1979, DJ Steve Dow led an anti-disco campaign that struck a chord throughout suburban America.